So just a few additional questions then. Um, so could we have made the mouse in a different way? Perhaps, I mean, I know it was easy because I just got it from my old boss, but um, is there a simpler way of doing this? Uh, and probably yes, by gene trapping, uh, trapping and I'll, I'll go into that next and then I'll answer these other two questions. So, um, so gene trapping um, is an interesting method. We've actually taken advantage of this for another knockout mouse we've worked on. Um, so there's uh, an international consortium called the International Gene Trap Consortium, and what they've done is made thousands of embryonic stem cell lines which um, each have a different gene trap uh, event in them. And the way these uh, gene trap events are created is that this consortium, so there's several groups around the world, part of this consortium, they take mouse embryonic stem cells, uh, they transfect them with a gene trap vector. This, as you'll see on the next slide, this vector randomly goes into the genome and, and traps a particular gene, i.e. turns off expression of a particular gene. Um, you can then figure out what gene it is has been targeted uh, and then make those embryonic stem cells freely available or relatively freely available. You sometimes have to pay a nominal fee to get hold of them. But you can then use these embryonic stem cells to um, uh, inject into mouse blastocysts and establish uh, a colony of mice in much the same way as if you'd gone to all the trouble of making a targeting construct and specifically targeting a particular gene. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through how this works here. Okay, so imagine we've got a gene up here. It's a simple gene. It's got a promoter in yellow and it's got these three exons in, in this greenish colour. And, uh, and this is what our gene trap vector looks like. Okay, so the key, or one of the key features is this splice acceptor sequence, okay, so this SA. Uh, we then have um, a LAC-Z gene, uh, which um, will cause expression of beta-galactosidase, which can be uh, used to detect expression, so where that gene is being expressed. Um, and then we've got our neomycin resistance cassette as well to allow us to select. So the idea is we take our embryonic stem cells and we introduce this gene trap vector and it will randomly integrate into the genome of our embryonic stem cells. And in the majority of cases, it will go into an intron sequence just because there's more intron than there, are, uh, than there is exon sequence in our genome. So we'll have um, lots of random integrations into our introns. And because it has a splice acceptor, what it will then do is interrupt gene expression of that particular gene that it's just randomly gone into. So instead of this particular uh, gene producing these, um, a protein from these three exons, you'll now have protein produced from the first exon, but then it will, uh, during splicing, it will splice onto the gene trap vector, uh, and instead of getting these two final exons produced, you'll get a fusion onto LAC-Z, and then you'll get a separate neomycin transcript produced. So you'll get this, an RNA comprising part of your um, gene that you ended up targeting randomly, uh, fused to LAC-Z, and then you'll get neomycin resistance. So the neomycin resistance is used to select for those cells that you've transfected. So you throw on neomycin and you kill off any cells that haven't been transfected. Um, and then um, your gene hopefully uh, has its expression um, uh, prevented. And instead of getting the full protein, you end up with a little stub of protein with beta-galactosidase uh, expressed um, on it. And by adding a particular chemical, you get a blue colour wherever beta-galactosidase is expressed. And so it's kind of an optional extra. You can see where your protein is expressed by this blue colour. But the key thing is that you lose expression of the gene and instead have this truncated protein. And with a simple bit of molecular biology and sequencing, you can figure out what this sequence is here. Therefore, what is the gene you've trapped? So if you do this repeatedly for all the embryonic stem cell lines you make, 
you could, in theory, end up with a library of embryonic stem cells covering um, every gene in the body. And I think we're just about there now. I think when you look, at, look through the consortium to see what they've got, you know, they'll have dozens of different embryonic stem cell lines for, for many genes that, that, that you look at. Maybe one has gone into intron one, one into intron two, another one in intron three, etc. And so you can you can pick your stem cell that you want to um, want to get from them, and then you can use that stem cell to establish a mouse colony in the same way that I described uh, for making a, a knockout mouse. Does that does that make sense? And it's a very simple way of making a knockout. So we did, did this for one particular gene. And sure enough, uh, it turned out that we'd completely lost expression of the gene because of this gene trapping event. And we could then treat it effectively as a knockout mouse. But it was very cheap and quick to make compared to having to go through the laborious homologous recombination process. OK, so, so we could have done it by gene trapping if we'd wanted to. OK, so what about another question? So we know that CD148 is not just expressed on platelets. So it's also on white blood cells and it's also on endothelial cells that are lining the blood vessels. So how can we be sure that the in vivo data, remember that, um, uh, that in vivo experiment where we used a laser to induce injury, that could be potentially due to the endothelial expressed CD148 and not the platelet expressed. So how do we just knock out CD148 in the platelet lineage, so create a mouse where just the platelets are lacking CD148 and all the other cells in the body have normal CD148. And that's called a, a conditional knockout mouse. So the guy that um, became famous for discovering how to do this is Klaus Raevsky. In 1993, he published a, a cell paper. Uh, and he's actually a B-cell immunologist, and he was fiddling around with immunoglobulin genes and showing using this Crelock system that I'll describe in a minute um, that you could do um, a, a conditional knockout of your gene in a particular cell lineage. So this is just a different way of looking at a traditional knockout before I tell you how the conditional knockout works. So, so if you remember a, a, a traditional knockout, you have um, a gene that you're trying to target in the genome, and then you have your targeting vector, which has flanking regions that are homologous to uh, regions of the gene you're targeting. And you have your neomycin resistance cassette in the middle that will interrupt expression of the gene when you get a, a, a homologous recombination event where your targeting sequence replaces the endogenous sequence. So we end up with this, um, uh, 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 this knockout allele. And we can go through the chimeric mouse and then breeding to make uh, pure knockouts. So the way conditionals work is that um, we introduce uh, recombinase sites um, into the genome. So these are LOXP recombinase sites uh, as represented by these yellow triangles. Okay, so, so here we're targeting the same gene with these four uh, exons. But now our targeting construct is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we've got a neomycin resistance cassette, and we've got these two LOXP sites that will be recognized by a recombinase enzyme called CRE. Okay? So we go through our, our homologous recombination process again in embryonic stem cells. And what we hope to get is this um, targeted event in the genome where actually there's, there's nothing wrong with this particular gene in terms of expression. It still has the, the four exons. It should, it should express normally. It just so happens that within the introns, we've now got a neomycin resistance cassette that was used to select the embryonic stem cells. And we've got these two uh, LOX P sites. Okay? And we can go through and we can make, um, uh, make a colony of mouse, mice, and these will be perfectly normal, except they've got uh, these recombinase sites in their genome. So now what we do is we cross our mouse with another strain of mouse, which is a transgenic mouse that expresses the Cree recombinase. So Cree, I think it comes from, 
a microorganism. It might be a yeast protein. I, f I forget. Um, you'll probably look it up for me now, won't you, and tell me where Cree comes from. But, <laughs> um, but it's not normally expressed in mice. So when we um, have a Cree expressed in a transgenic mice, what that Cree will do, it will recognise these LOXP sites in the genome and um, it will um, flip out uh, these two exons, so the region um, within those um, recombinase sites, within those LOXP sites. So we get a recombination um, event. So we could, if we were to cross our, our gene-targeted mouse with a mouse that expresses Cree in every cell type, then we just end up with a, a global knockout. Every cell would have its um, CD148 gene uh, recombined in this way. But if we use a mouse where Cree is only expressed in certain lineages, so for example, uh, you could use um, a platelet-specific promoter driving expression of your Cree, and you could make a transgenic mouse in that way, then you'd only have Cree expressed in the platelet lineage, and you'd only get knockout of CD148 uh, in cells of the platelet lineage, i.e. the megakaryocytes, which go on to produce the platelets. Does that make sense? Yep. Do you want to know that's right? Go on, then. It's the lambda phage. Oh, okay. Lambda phage, cool. Okay. I won't ask you why the lambda phage needs Cree recombinase, but um, save that for an essay answer or something. But that, that really is outside reading. Or are you going to tell me anyway? No. But it's just similar in structure to the domain of the integrators. Okay, okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, you're useful to have along in lectures, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you along to other lectures I have in future. <laughs> so it could be wrong, right? <laughs> no, thanks for that. So um, there's, there are dozens and dozens of transgenic mice now expressing Cree in different lineages. So uh, it's almost like an off-the-shelf. If you want to um, make your platelet-specific knockout, you just get your platelet-specific cream mouse either from a collaborator or you can, you can buy them in. So um, does that all make sense with respect to um, making conditional knockouts? So um, things are getting a little more complicated now. In recent years, people have realised that actually having a neomycin um, cassette can affect gene expression. So if we go back here, I was telling you that this is perfectly normal, but actually people have found that because you've got a neomycin, an active gene in the middle of your CD148 gene, for example, that can affect expression of the gene. So uh, people have devised a method of getting rid of the neomycin. Okay, and the way they do that is with a second recombinase. Okay, so you make your... Uh, targeting vector slightly more complicated. You don't just have the yellow uh, LOX P sites. You also have red uh, FRET sites uh, flanking the neomycin cassette. So when you go through the process of homolog homologous recombination, you can at some point, either in the embryonic stem cells, actually yeah, it, would, it would be in the embryonic stem cells, once you've got a clone of embryonic stem cells where you're content that this, recombination, that this homologous recombination has taken place, you can introduce uh, the flip recombinase, which will recognise the FRET sites and it will flip out the neomycin resistance. So it gets rid of the neomycin cassette before you then... Um, put your embryonic stem cells into a blastocyst and make a mouse to ensure that you don't have the neomycin potentially screwing up expression of your, of your gene in some way. I thought you had a question, yes. Can you do that only with Cree? But you see, if, if you were to use Cree at this stage, you'd then lose the Cree for doing the conditional down here. Yeah, you're right. You can you can do it, it, it but it, it it's a low chance. You'd have to do a lot of screening. So you're saying have three LOX P sites in effect. Yeah, you need to express two recombinases. Well, not at the same time. You do you do the flip recombinase in, in the embryonic stem cell itself. 
So once you've established the embryonic stem cell, you've gone through the selection, you know your clone is what you want, you then transfect in, flip recombinase, flip out the, um, the neo, and, and then um, use that cell to make a mouse. Yeah. I, I thought your question was, could you use three uh, Cree site, Cree, three locks P sites at this stage? And the answer is you can, because sometimes you can, if you're lucky, you'll just get recombination between two of them, yeah, yeah, and you've still got two left. Yeah. But yeah, that, that, I think it's a low probability of success. So people now tend to just use this second recombinase site. Um, so this is now the state-of-the-art way of, of doing it. Okay, uh, so finally, um, one final question. So say we were working in this um, pharmaceutical company in Germany who are making inhibitors to CD148, and they're specific for human CD148, obviously, because you want to treat humans, not mice. Well, how could you test whether your inhibitor works in a mouse model when mouse actually has mouse CD148, not human CD148. Well, the way you can do this, and, and this is done very widely in, in the pharmaceutical industry, you just make a humanized mouse where you knock in the human um, sequence um, into the mouse genome. So I'll just first start by telling you how we make a knock-in mouse. So this is where we um, introduce um, a particular mutation into the genome. So maybe this would be if we wanted to make a, a phosphatase dead version of the enzyme, for example. So the particular mutation we're going to introduce is denoted with an asterisk just here. So the aim is to make, a, a say, a point mutation in exon 1 that changes one of the amino acids. This would be a classic knock-in sort of approach. So um, here we have our targeting vector, which uh, has some sort of negative selection. Um, it has the, the neomycin cassette, and it has the flanking regions, exon 1, exon 2, which will hopefully homologously recombine with the mouse uh, genomic sequence. And so when we get this um, homologous recombination and we can remove the neomycin afterwards with uh, the flip recombinase, uh, we're left with uh, pretty much normal genome sequence apart from this tiny remnant of the recombinase site in red, but now we've got this mutation, this asterisk that, we, that derived from our original targeting vector. So we're not knocking out gene expression, we're uh, just knocking in a mutant form which allows us to test function of that particular mutant. People happy with that? It's a simple knock-in. It's, it's done quite a lot now if you want to um, target particular residues to see if they're important. It could be a tyrosine that's particularly important for being phosphorylated and taking part in the signaling, for example. It could be if you want to make a kinase dead or a phosphatase dead version of your protein. Yeah. How do you stop the human protein causing an immunogenic reaction in the mouse? That's not a problem because the, the mouse will see it as self because it's, been, it's in the mouse genome. It's, it's been expressed in the mouse all the way through development of the immune system. Um, yeah, so it, it will... This mouse wouldn't. It would now see the real form of the protein as non-self. So no, because as I say, it, it's you know you're starting with the embryonic stem cell that gives rise to all the other cells in the body. So it would be anything you do would be seen as as self. Actually, for for one of the proteins I work on. Um, it's really hard to make antibodies because this protein happens to be identical between mouse and human. So um, a group in France, interestingly, managed to make antibodies to this protein. They made mouse anti-human antibodies by making the antibodies in the knockout mouse for that protein. So all they did, they had the knockout mouse, they then put immunised the mouse with wild-type cells and it saw the... Um, you know, the real mouse protein is a foreign protein because it, it had never had it. It was a knockout mouse. It had never expressed that protein. So it recognised it as foreign, uh, even though it was a mouse protein. So it's, re it's really what you're, you know, what you're born with, what you're conceived with is regarded as self. Okay, and so the humanised um, 
So we now go through that same knock-in approach, but instead of knocking in a single point mutation, we knock in the entire gene for the human. So we replace the mouse gene with the human gene. So um, here we've got a gene that has uh, six exons uh, in mouse and human. We have um, flanking DNA that's um, identical to the mouse uh, in our targeting vector. So these X's um, indicate where the flanking uh, homologous regions are. Um, and if we get homologous recombination between these two flanking regions, we will end up replacing the mouse exons and the introns in between with uh, the human sequence. And here again, they're using the, um, the FRET flip system for excising the neomycin cassette um, afterwards. And the end result is you have a uh, mouse sequence suddenly running into the human gene and then back into the mouse sequence. Okay, does that, that make sense? So it's, a, it's like a, a knock-in, but in a, in a big way by knocking in an entire gene. So you'll have quite a big targeting construct. So that can be quite tricky to make for some genes, particularly very big genes. But this is very useful, say, in the pharmaceutical industry. They have um, inhibitors to CD148. This now allows them to test their inhibitors in a mouse model because this mouse expresses human CD148. And if it works in the mouse model, then there's a good chance you can translate that into the clinic and start using it on humans. So what I've covered then is transgenic mice, um, how this resulted in the original uh, gene knockout method by homologous recombination, um, this quick and easy method by gene trapping that I described, conditional gene knockout, knocking out in a particular cell type, and then finally knock-in mice, which allows you to knock in mutations or knock in the whole human gene, if, if you so wish. Okay, and um, I got quite a bit of the information from this review, which uh, is about the mouse genetics uh, toolkit. Okay. So would you believe we're now on the second lecture? What, what happened to time? Um, but it's CRISPR. So you guys are pretty familiar with CRISPR now, are you, from Dr. Sanchez Moran, uh, Moran's stuff? Okay, so I'll, I can, I'll go through this quite quickly, I think. Just shout if I'm going too fast. So um, a quick introduction to CRISPR-Cas um, and some applications that we've used in our lab. So it's a kind of how to do it kind of lecture. So, as you probably know, um, so genome engineering by CRISPR-Cas is, is sparking something of a revolution, and we can now efficient, efficiently edit the genome um, in any organism, essentially, anywhere between 1% and 50% um, efficiency. Whereas if we go back to embryonic stem cells and the homologous recombination, it's incredibly rare. So to get your desired recombination could be only one in a million or, or um, even more unlikely. And you have to do lots of screening and selection to get that embryonic stem cell that is exactly the one you want that will allow you to make your knockout mouse. Okay. So what discoveries led to this revolution? Well, I guess the first discovery was that scientists figured out that when you have a double-stranded break in your genome, the cell immediately wants to repair that because it would be catastroph catastrophic if the cell started to divide and it had a, a double-stranded break. So it does it very quickly, but often in an error-prone way. So it uses non-homologous end joining, and that will often either delete regions or it will uh, insert bases and you end up then disrupting um, the gene if this was, say, um, in, an, in an exon. Uh, the cell can use homology-directed repair if there is a donor template present. So uh, if there's a donor template that matches up, the cell can use that to repair the double-stranded break. Okay, so two consequences of a double-stranded break, either error-prone non-homologous end joining or this homology-directed repair. Um, and so um, how could you introduce these um, double-strand breaks? Well, you probably came across mega-nucleases, zinc-finger nucleases, and these 
uh, transcription activator-like effectors with um, Eugenio stuff. These have the drawback that they uh, recognise specific DNA sequences uh, through protein DNA interactions, and so you have problems with off-target effects and also the design cost. So I can remember when I first heard about uh, the zinc finger method, um, and someone told me, oh, yeah, you can contact Sigma, the company, and they'll, they'll make one for you, and you can make a knockout. It was £25,000 for them to provide you with one of these things. I thought, that's not really the sort of money I can afford, so I didn't go down that route. Um, but CRISPR-Cas has come along, and it's a really cheap, really effective method of doing this. So it uses an RNA-guided nuclease. Uh, this uh, big yellow blob is the actual nuclease protein. And it binds to an RNA uh, called a, a, a Cas9-associated guide RNA. And, and this complex will then scan the genome. And when it sees a match of that RNA to the genome, it will introduce a double-stranded break. So that's... That's how you can get a double-stranded break and, and, and allow you to start to think about editing the genome. Um, how was this discovered? So what was the, the history behind this? So, um, yeah, this is just a stupid joke, but I'll try it on you. So, um, you know, what's a virus? Um, oops, yeah, that's a virus. And then what's a retrovirus? Yeah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> terrible joke, isn't it? Anyway, um, so, the, so viruses, the most abundant biological agents on the planet, and, um, and a, a major class of these are bacteriophages, and bac bacteriophages essentially eat bacteria. So if you're a bacterium, you're very frightened of these things because they're going to eat you, so the chances are you might have developed ways of combating these bacteriophages, and that's that's how CRISPR came along. So um, I can show my shocked baby um, picture. So the shocked baby, why do these bacteria and archaea have these uh, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeat regions um, that were found when people started to sequence the genomes of bacteria and archaea? You know, what, what are these things doing? Um, and... And so this is what they, they look like, these, these regions that were found in the genomes of bacteria. So these series of, um, of short palindromic repeats of about 20 base pairs interspaced with uh, spacer regions. And then upstream were the cast genes that were so-called because they lay upstream of these um, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Okay. And um, so a big breakthrough in 2005, they actually found that some of these spacers corresponded to sequences in viruses, so these bacteriophage viruses that are attacking the bacteria. And it turned out that if bacteria had one of these viral sequences, they were immune to attack from the bacteriophage. So amazingly, this is a kind of bacterial immune system. And um, so this was the key paper in science back in 2007. And um, I used to eat yogurts made by Danisco as a kid. Anyone eaten a Danisco yogurt? They don't really sell them anymore, but yeah, I used to eat loads of Danisco yogurts. And I guess the reason they were into this research is yogurts need bacteria to, to make them. And you don't want these nasty bacteriophages attacking all your bacteria if you're trying to make these lovely yogurts. So I guess this is why the, the yogurt company, Danisco, were, were funding some of this work and why they were involved in it. But the idea here is that we've got our, our nice bacteria producing yogurt, perhaps. It's being attacked by a bacteriophage. And if the bacterium has acquired some uh, of these fragments of the invading DNA from the virus, it will have resistance to that particular virus. And so the way this uh, bacterial immunity works is we get an acquisition stage where uh, some of these spaces are acquired from these evading, invading um, viral uh, genomes. They then get uh, expressed, um, and then they're uh, assembled with, um, with Cas proteins, which are these nucleases which use the viral sequence to then um, to guide the enzyme 
to that virus and chop up its um, genome, so preventing it from um, infecting the bacterium. Is this all very familiar to you guys from your other, yeah? Um, and just a very simple overview then of how this works. So we have our, our virus invading, and then certain Cas enzymes will um, incorporate some of the viral uh, genome uh, into these uh, spacer regions, um, and this can be then used to hook up with another Cas protein, which will uh, use it as a guide to target to the viral genome and, um, and degrade that viral genome with a, a double-stranded cut. So you, this is a way now um, scientists have figured out how to specifically target regions uh, of our genomes, of mammalian cells, by taking advantage of this um, ancient bacterial um, immune system. And so um, our, our guide RNA will have um, a target-specific sequence that guides it to the place in the genome where we want our double-stranded break. And it will also have a transactivating uh, region um, that allows it to bind to the Cas9 protein. Um, and so uh, it scans the genome, and wherever it finds one of these PAM motifs with a, a GG sequence, it will stop, um, unravel um, the, the two strands, um, and if it's a perfect match in its guide sequence, um, it will then do a, a, a double-stranded cut, and that will then be immediately repaired by uh, usually uh, an error-prone, non-homologous end joining, which will either remove bases or add bases, so interrupting normal expression of that gene, and that's how you can quickly generate um, a knockout in a, in a cell line. And I'll quickly show you this um, video, just so you're absolutely clear on this. Oh, it's a bit quiet, isn't it? Oh, it's very quiet. genomes is a remarkable protein known as CRISPR-Cas9, which naturally occurs in many bacteria as an immunity mechanism. The Cas9 protein acts like a pair of highly specific molecular scissors that can be directed to cut and therefore edit almost any gene in any organism. Here's how it works. To edit a cell's genome, scientists introduce the Cas9 protein and a guide RNA with a specific sequence that will direct where the Cas9 protein will make a cut in the DNA. Cas9 binds to the guide RNA and scans the cell's DNA, looking for a particular recognition sequence, which is two G bases next to each other. When it finds such a sequence, Cas9 opens up the DNA double helix to check whether the adjacent sequence is complementary to those of the guide RNA. If they're not, Cas9 continues scanning. However, if all of the DNA bases match the targeting sequence of the guide RNA, Cas9 will cut both strands of that DNA. In order to repair the damage, the cell will then do one of two things. First, it can directly stick the ends together, often creating mutations at the site of the break. This allows scientists to use Cas9 to disrupt any gene. On the other hand, Cells often tend to fix the damage without causing mutations. To do so, the cells look to repair the DNA with matching sequences. By introducing a matching DNA sequence that contains desired genetic alterations, scientists can induce the cell to incorporate just about any desired change into its genome. This is how the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic editing system allows scientists to precisely disrupt or modify genes. Right, so um, in terms of applications then, so as you can imagine, we've a huge number of applications. So um, in, um, in biology for creating new animal models, so we can um, specifically edit the mouse genome, for example, to make uh, 
disease models that have particular mutations in genes uh, driving disease. Uh, we can also uh, make uh, point mutations if we want um, to um, study the consequences of certain mutations, certain genetic variation. Um, then in, in biotech, it's proving very useful. So um, I, I scribbled these examples on just before I came out because I always, always forget the, the biotech aspects. But um, so engineering um, um, algae uh, to make uh, generate silica-based diatoms that are useful for drug delivery, uh, also for uh, improving food security. So you can uh, modify your crops by genome editing without having to introduce new DNA, which would fall foul of the genetically modified um, organisms. But potentially just doing subtle uh, alterations with CRISPR could get around that and be more, a more acceptable way of generating uh, better disease-resistant uh, crops. And then you could also engineer um, uh, algae or corn, for example, to produce ethanol for fuel uh, just by tweaking with various um, enzymes uh, in their genomes using CRISPR-Cas. And then finally, for, for medicine, um, so for uh, testing drugs, for example, um, where you could potentially uh, correct mutated genes in humans. We're not there yet, but there's a possibility of doing that to correct genetic diseases. And then finally, drug development. Um, you could make uh, animal models or, or cell lines that have particular mutations that drive disease and use those then to screen for drugs that could be used to treat the disease. So, so huge applications of this uh, genome editing. And... Um, We've done this quite a lot in my lab, so uh, we haven't done it in animals, but we've done it in, in cell lines. It's a very nice way of, of studying genes by knocking them out in cell lines with CRISPR-Cas and then looking at the functional consequences. So this would be a, a simple way of doing it. We have a, a vector system which has the Cas9 protein um, and we insert our particular guide sequence of, of interest that will target the Cas9 to a particular gene. We've got the U6 RNA polymerase driving expression of our small guide RNA uh, and then this strong chicken beta actin promoter driving expression of the Cas9. So we introduce our guide RNA into this vector by just standard molecular biology. We then transfect this plasmid into cultured cells and then we select the cells where we've got our, our gene deleted. And it's an incredibly cheap and easy uh, thing to do, as you'll see in the, the following slide. So, so this is the vector we use in my lab. It's uh, uh, from, um, from AdGene, which are a, a great supplier of, um, of various vectors, um, essentially for free. Um, so the features of this gene, you've got your Cas9 protein expressed, that's in the, the maroon colour. Um, then we've got um, a multiple cloning site up here to insert our guide RNA. Um, quite crucially, actually, we've got a puramycin resistance marker, so this allows us to select for cells that have been transfected, so we kill off all of the non-transfected cells with puramycin. So, so how do we go about selecting our, um, our particular guide sequence to target a particular gene? Well, here's an example where we've targeted a protein called ADAM10, and we like to use the Sanger a CRISPR design tool. There are many others out there, uh, uh, but Sanger have a good algorithm and a nice, easy-to-use website. So you simply specify whether you've got a human or a mouse sequence that you're targeting, put in your gene symbol, and then it pulls out um, all the exons that make up that particular gene, because for this technique, you want to target the exons. You want to actually interrupt um, the sequence of the exons so that you can generate um, a knockout. When you click on one of these particular um, exons, it will give you all of the, um, the guide sequences um, that it's found. So the little blue specks here are the PAM sites, and then the green is the 20 base pairs um, of RNA that would make up the guide sequence. And then up here we have the view of, of the exon. So um, this is our um, first exon um, running into an intron here, so the gene is running in this direction. And where you have uh, the, the filled in, 
that means it's actually a coding sequence. So we have five prime untranslated going into the coding sequence, and then it tells you where um, the various CRISPR sequences are. I think for this, I set a quite a stringent threshold, so we don't actually have any in that coding exon, but by tweaking uh, the numbers or searching other exons, it's quite easy to find good um, guide sequences. You can zoom in and click on individual ones, and it will give you uh, the sequence of the guide. Here's the PAM site, the GG. And it will then give you a report. Uh, it's blasted this sequence against the rest of the genome, and it will tell you uh, whether you have other places in the genome which uh, have similar sequence. So off-target effects. Um, so this is telling us that um, there is one place in the genome that has no mismatches, so one place which is identical. But that's this very sequence, okay? So you, you always get a, a, a one as a perfect match because it, it's actually the gene itself is a perfect match. A one mismatch, well, there are no places in the genome which have this sequence with just one base different. There are no places which have this sequence with just two bases different. But there are four other places in the genome where there's a, a, a three mismatch. So you, you get an idea of... Um, of how unique this sequence is in the genome. And actually, this is perfect because uh, a mismatch of three would mean the CRISPR wouldn't work properly anyway. Okay, so, um, so you then just simply order two overlapping uh, DNA primers for that um, guide region. So, you know, you're talking um, probably a fiver to, to order those primers, very cheap. Um, simply anneal them together and then clone them into that uh, vector I told you about. Uh, transfect your cells with that vector. Get rid of the non-transfected cells with puramycin. If you remember, we've got a puramycin resistance uh, cassette in our vector. And then I'll, the example I'll show you, we've simply tested the pool of cells that resulted for ADAM10 expression by flow cytometry, a, a technique to detect cell surface expression. This is a, a cell surface membrane protein to see how well the, the, the techniques worked. And then we can make single cell clones by limiting dilution and end up with pure populations of, of knockout cells to work with. So, um, so this is just the data. Um, uh, actually, this, this was generated by one of you guys, so a guy called Ed Davis in 2016, who was on, on your course and came and did his project in my lab. So he'd taken Jercat, the Jercat T-cell line, he'd transfected it um, with uh, one of these uh, constructs that targets ADAM10. This is a control cell, which has normal ADAM10 expression, and the uh, fluorescent green trace is the showing you the ADAM10 um, expression on the cell surface versus the negative control uh, in black. And you can see where he's done his knockouts and just generated a pool of cells. It's worked phenomenally well. So um, over 90% of the cells uh, are knockouts, and he's just got this small little blip of uh, a, a relatively small proportion of cells where the knockout hasn't worked. So, I mean, in this case, I actually said to Ed, oh, you might as well just start doing experiments on these because you've already got a population of cells that are almost 100% knockout. But he also went on and cloned them and, and made uh, pure populations of ADAM10 knockout cells. But that just kind of shows how, how quick and easy to do this is. I mean, it probably only took him three or four weeks from, from start to finish. And, and it works very well. So this is just our experience of it. So we've now knocked out five different uh, genes. We've done it in four different cell lines. And you can see we've only had one failure. So one of our four ADAM10 guides failed to work. But for, for the others, we, we have 100% success rate. So very easy way of, of knocking out gene expression um, in any cell type, really. And of course, you could do this in uh, embryonic stem cells as a way of, of making um, gene knockout mice. Or if you did it in human embryonic stem cells that we can culture in the lab, you could then differentiate those into any cell you like, macrophages, platelets, potentially, um, to then study those particular cell types. 
Um, and by one thing we haven't done yet in the lab, but which other groups have done and which we're going to try soon, is instead of just doing a knockout where you get an insertion or a deletion that, that disrupts expression of your gene, to actually give a repair template uh, that has a particular mutation in it so that you can actually introduce um, changes in DNA sequence into the genome by providing this repair template uh, with this um, mutation. Um, it's not as easy to do, it's not as efficient, but you'll find many, many papers out there which have used this technique. Um, so what are the advantages then of, of using um, uh, this sort of editing? Well, you, can, you could make a cell line with a particular disease mutation that you could then study. Uh, you could take a cell line, like a tumour cell line, that has existing disease mutations, maybe driving the cancer, and you could correct those and see if you could now revert uh, the disease. Um, you could do structure function investigations. So if you've got a protein that you're interested in, don't just knock it out. Uh, knock in different mutations uh, so that you start to figure out what parts of the protein are really important for various functions. If it's a kinase, you could make it kinase dead, for example, and, and see uh, just how important that kinase domain is for its function. And you could also make an inactive mutant uh, that would mimic the effects of having a small molecule inhibitor. So this would be um, to test whether inhibiting this protein would, be, uh, would have some potential therapeutic value. Okay, so we're nearly at the end. Um, possibly a cleverer way of doing knockouts and knock-ins is a more specific way by using two guides at the same time. So the way you do this is you have one guide targeting one strand, the other guide targets the other strand, but, but very close, okay? And you end up with um, this sort of double-stranded break um, uh, with a kind of overhang um, and it's incredibly unlikely that you'd get this sort of double-stranded double break due to off-target effects. Because say, this guide number one just happened to cut somewhere else in the genome. Um, sorry, I should back up and say, are we using a particular type of Cas9 here which has been modified such that it works not to introduce double-stranded breaks, but to be a nicase and just to induce a single-stranded break, okay? So each one of these Cas9s, these modified Cas9s, is, is giving you just a single-stranded break. So the only way to get a double-stranded break is if these happen to both work in effectively the same place, very close to each other. So if you had off-target effects elsewhere in the genome, say this one was working somewhere else, all that would happen, it would cause a little nick somewhere else in the genome, chances are this one wouldn't be anywhere near and um, it would just repair normally and you wouldn't get a, a modification. So this is something we haven't done, but a way of, of really avoiding um, off-target effects. Okay, so um, people are now making knockout mice using this method. The way that works is you, they tend to use um, the... Uh, purified Cas9 protein and co-inject it into a fertilised egg with the guide RNA. That seems to be the state of the art for making knockout models. And all sorts of creatures, as you probably know, have been modified in this way now. Um, and um, there's no one waiting to come in. Shall I just go for an extra five minutes? Do you guys have anything you need to go to? No? Shall I just carry on for hours? <laughs> you heard her. You can kill her later. Okay, so, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll maybe go another five minutes if that's okay. Um, so uh, CRISPR-Cas is becoming the method of choice now for making knockout mice. It's, um, it's quicker. It's about 30% cheaper than doing it with the homologous recombination method, which required that um, targeting construct to be made. You can do it with, with any strain of mice, um, and um, it has a higher success rate. So uh, this is the kind of uh, classical um, uh, embryonic stem cell uh, method, which um, 
can take um, a long time, so up to 18 months to finally get your knockout after you've gone through all that, that procedure that I talked about in the first lecture. But the way you do it with CRISPR-Cas is much quicker. You simply micro-inject your Cas9 protein and your guide RNA um, into a, um, a, a one-celled oocyte. That goes back into a, a pseudopregnant female. You then have um, litters born, um, and so you um, completely skip that whole chimeric stage and all that breeding, and you end up with um, hopefully uh, transmission to um, all of your offspring, and you can then um, expand those up. And um, you're going to have to do a bit of screening and molecular biology just to figure out um, exactly what sort of gene modification has been made and to confirm that you've got knockout of your, of your protein. Does that, that make sense? Um, and it's also clear that you can do multiple knockouts at the same time. Um, so you could um, use CRISPR-Cas to knock out a whole bunch of, of genes in embryonic stem cells. So you could knock out a whole gene family, for example, at the same time. And um, so this, is, this has been done. If you read that cell paper, you'll see examples of where they have, uh, have made multiple knockouts. If you had to do this with the classical homologous recombinant, recombination route, I mean, you'd have to do them one at a time and do lots of breedings to do your double and your triple, etc. knockouts. But this is a, a very quick way of, of doing multiple knockouts. And often with gene families, you have to to, to see a phenotype. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that uh, we're starting to see now in publications is genome scale uh, functional screening. So. Uh, Scientists have developed whole libraries of guide RNAs that cover the entire genome of an organism, uh, and then using something like a lentivirus to deliver these, um, this library, you can um, introduce into cells and select cells that have interesting um, phenotypes as a result of, of this kind of random knockout approach. And once you've got a cell with an interesting phenotype, um, you can then select that cell and figure out what the gene was that's been mutated by this CRISPR. You know, with some simple sequencing, you can, you can figure that out um, and identify uh, new genes with, with interesting functions. So just to summarise then, CRISPR-Cas, as you know, has come from um, acquired immunity to bac bacteria for, against bacteriophages in, in bacteria and archaea. And it's only been going a, a few years, but it's a real revolution in the sort of work we do. We can now very easily and uh, efficiently uh, knock out genes in almost any cell type, and there's great potential for things like gene therapy, correcting uh, human diseases, for example. So, um, so this review from um, the Charpentier group, who's she's one of the real pioneers of, of CRISPR-Cas, so that that's an interesting read. That's only just come out in Cell. Nice review. And then, oh yeah, you've, I was going to finally briefly mention the, the workshop tomorrow. So um, I kind of made this up quite quickly. Hopefully it will be quite interesting. Dr. Soller said, oh, just pick one of your papers where you've done knockout mice and, and various other uh, gene modification techniques. Put them into groups, get them to each present one of the figures. Um, and I thought, I've got just the paper for doing this. It was something that we were about to submit. Of course, papers drag on. It turns out that this paper I was thinking of, we haven't yet got published. In fact, we, we just got our first reviewer's comments on it, um, not last week, I think the week before. So I thought, why not give it to you guys? You don't know whether it got accepted or rejected, but you can present the figures. Uh, we can have a discussion about it, and then we can decide whether we accept the paper for publication or not. And then I'll tell you what the reviewers actually said, and I'll tell you whether it got accepted or rejected. And you'll get to learn something about the review process. You can see what the reviewers' comments were, how generous or harsh they were. Um, so it could be quite an interesting exercise, actually. It's... Um, Possibly. You never know. Or champagne. You'll find out tomorrow. But it, I think it'll be, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because we'll, 
in future years, there probably will never be this situation again where I've, I've just had a paper reviewed and, um, and can keep it hidden from you whether it got published or not. Does that sound good? So shall I, um, on canvas, put a, a more truncated version of the paper that's single-spaced? I'll do that as soon as I get back. So you only have to print out 20 pages or whatever. Okay? Thank you very much. Sorry to go a bit over.